I'm the same way. Oh, you're a paranoid schizophrenic too? I'm not schizophrenic. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Last of Us Episode 3 video. There were a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references to the game, so we'll break it all down. It's probably going to go down as one of the best episodes of the series and probably one of the best episodes of television just period this year. If you're brand new to the channel, I'm doing videos for all the episodes. Be sure to subscribe to get them all. We're doing a giveaway for HBO Max subscriptions. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and just post your favorite moment from the episode on the video. Careful for spoilers of the episode if you haven't seen it yet. We'll go through shot by shot talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments, starting with the episode title, Long Long Time, a reference to the Linda Ronstadt song that Frank and Bill played for each other, which is all about surviving in general, being alone, human relationships, being in love, which was a big theme of the episode and just of the Last of Us series in general. Trying to survive, allowing yourself to be open to human relationships, creating close bonds with each other. The opening scene of the episode is of Joel and Ellie right after the events of episode 2 with Joel soothing his wounded hand nearby in a stream and constructing a pyramid out of rocks from the stream. The rock tower he's building is just meant to be a memorial to Tess. Like his way of eulogizing her, remembering her, because he's trying to push past all these negative emotions, all this sadness inside him. That's a big thing with his character, like he doesn't want to have anything to do with dealing with his feelings. There'll be no therapy in this episode or future episodes anytime soon. That's one of the big differences with Ellie's character is that she wants to open up. She wants to talk about all these really hard things, these traumatic things that happen to them. But Joel doesn't want to deal with any of that stuff right now, at least. Just going to tamp down on all those terrible negative feelings inside me and continue on. He's just about sheer survival right now, like he's in pure survival mode. Going to tamp down all those terrible negative emotions inside me. The part that they cut from the game here is at the end of episode two, they have to continue escaping the rest of the way out of Boston. In the game, they use the abandoned subway terminals until they get to the woods outside of Lincoln, which is where they're headed to where Bill lives. The fact that Joel gave her his jacket here to stay warm is also meant to be a sign that he's slowly treating her in a more caring way, like he's being a little bit more thoughtful, even though he's still trying to push her away, as you see at the end of the episode. It's not because he totally hates Ellie or he blames her for Tess's death or anything like that. It's just that he's afraid to get close to other people because ultimately he feels like he's going to lose them and will just make him feel even worse. He doesn't want to hit rock bottom emotionally again. Like he actually genuinely cared about Tess and it hurt badly to lose her after losing his daughter. So he doesn't want to go through the pain of that again. And that's why he doesn't want to get close to Ellie, at least right now. But it all goes back to the theme of the episode, that Linda Ronstadt song, and the whole idea of Bill's arc in the series and how he got close to Frank and how it ultimately fulfilled him. He was happy to go out the way that he did because Frank had enriched his life so much. So a lot of Bill's storyline in the episode, especially the message that he leaves for him, is meant to inspire Joel to get closer to Ellie. Ultimately, it'll be worth it for better and worse. And throughout a lot of these early parts of the series, you see Ellie's influence on him. Like she's relentlessly positive in the face of all this terrible stuff that's happening to them. Just a lot of her enjoying things in the moment. A lot of the first that she has, like seeing the forest for the first time. Like she's never been camping, never been outside the quarantine zones. She's never been in a car before. So the whole idea is that you see little moments like this throughout the episode, throughout the series, the first couple of episodes where Joel slowly starts to act a little bit more like a dad with her. If you zoom and enhance on her backpack here too, you notice that she has her monster keychain from the games, a little Easter egg. I don't think that Neil Druckmann has ever explained where the actual monster keychain came from or what inspired it. It looks like it's either based on Pixar's Monsters Inc. like Mike Wazowski or the Ugly Dolls line of toys. We might learn how she actually got it in the flashbacks in her origin story when they tell those in future episodes. The reason why she doesn't have the backpack from the games yet, like this is a slightly different backpack, is because she doesn't get that one till much later in the first game. So we might also see her get that backpack in a future episode. Because for the most part, like the clothes that she's wearing, the clothes that Joel's wearing, pretty much everybody else for the most part, are right out of the game. They're meant to be fairly accurate costumes. Later in the episode, Ellie also gets another one of her video game t-shirts. Even during episode two, the lighter that Tess used to sacrifice herself is right out of the games. Neil Druckmann said that the costume department and the props departments paid special attention to that. They were always asked how to make things look more like they did in the game. A lot of their dialogue here is also taken directly out of the game. Only ever been in the woods. What? Nothing. It's just... I've never seen anything like this, that's all. You mean the woods? Yeah. Never walked through the woods. It's kind of cool. <laughs> The reason why Joel is taking them to Bill's is because he thinks that they can get a car there that will take them the rest of the way to Wyoming to Joel's brother. 
and because of the timing of the episode when a bunch of the big events wind up happening at this point when he's taking them there he still thinks that Bill and Frank are still alive. The way they timed this, the way the countdown works on the radio, the warning message that goes off, it sounds like they died right before the events of episode one. But as they start hiking the rest of the way, Joel starts to explain to her that the real danger here isn't so much the infected, it's actually the raiders, the real people. And that's a big thing throughout the entire Last of Us series through the games. The idea that people are just as bad as the fungus. We will continue to meet very terrible, very bad people as we go along through the series. In fact, Troy Baker, who did the voice of Joel in the games, is actually playing one of the antagonistic characters later in the series. No spoilers about what's going on with their group because we will see them in a future episode. But this is Troy Baker from the games. They also use a lot of Bill and Frank's flashbacks to show you that sometimes humans can be just as bad as the infected. Like when Ellie finds the bodies next to the downed airplane. He explains that all the people were killed by the military not because they were infected but because they didn't have room for them in the quarantine zones and it was very much shoot first ask questions later which is another reference to the death of his daughter like she died even though she wasn't infected. Bill makes a lot of references to the government during the episode too like you shouldn't trust the government they're all terrible. Turns out he was right. Joel starts referencing people and things that they'll reveal in future flashbacks like how he got the scar, who Frank is. When they're looking for supplies in the convenience store that Joel keeps stashed, Ellie finds the Mortal Kombat 2 arcade machine. It's a reference to an in-game easter egg for Mortal Kombat 2. Ellie had a poster of it on her bed at the beginning of the game. The friend she mentions who was really into it is Riley, who she's referenced a couple times in the series so far, played by Storm Reed. We'll see her in future flashbacks. All of her story takes place before Ellie met Joel, so it'll all be dealt with in flashbacks. While she's exploring the store, she finds the trapped remains of either the former owner or a fellow survivor who had been infected and trapped there while the ceiling had collapsed. He's meant to be in the shambler state, which is what they turn into a little while after the initial stage, which are runners. The collapse seemed like it happened a long time ago, but maybe he just didn't turn fast enough because the body couldn't find enough fuel, that the fungus didn't have enough fuel to evolve him into the next state. This whole scene is about her taking her anger out on it, showing that she's not afraid, mostly to reassure herself, but also as a cathartic way to deal with all the really messed up stuff that's happened to her and all the even more messed up stuff that happened in the flashbacks that we haven't seen yet. So it was less of her trying to do something good, putting it out of its misery, than it was about her finding catharsis through it. Also to show you that she's not quite as helpless as she seems. Which also dovetails with the idea that she keeps asking Joel for a gun throughout the episode until she finally finds Bill's gun at the end of the episode. That'll probably come in handy pretty soon. The crash plane isn't meant to be the same one from episode one because that was happening way down in Austin, but it is a callback to that. The whole idea as Joel is explaining what happened is that during the chaos, people started turning while all these planes were mid-air causing most of them to crash all over the world. Joel saying that he knows how to fly is another reference to his history in the military. They also have an easter egg for Sully's plane from Uncharted in the Last of Us games because Naughty Dog, who make the Last of Us games, also made the Uncharted games. Joel explains the origin of the Cordyceps fungus to Ellie, which we saw during the flashbacks in episode 2. And his explanation, which he's just making an educated guess about, is totally correct. The Cordyceps was a common fungus that mutated and infected the flower made in the world's largest flower factory in Jakarta and was distributed all over the world, winding up in people's food products. Even though there was that one person that the military lost track of like, oh, we don't know where that one person went to and they theoretically went around biting people and the fungus spread that way, it spread across the world even faster because of the flour. The big takeaway here is to switch to eating more rice instead of so much bread and flour products. This episode sponsored by rice. Joel also confirms the pancake flour theory from episode one. The reason why he, his brother, and his daughter didn't turn like everyone else is because they were out of pancake flour that day, whereas their neighbors had the biscuits, the cookies. He goes on to recall everything that happened that night in 2003 that we saw part of during episode one. At this point, he's not speculating anymore because he's speaking from experience, like he's recounting things as they happen to him. And even though we're still kind of dealing with a global pandemic in real life right now, everything that's happening in the episode isn't meant to be a reference to that, even if it feels like it. All the stuff with the fungus spreading and all that craziness was written more than 10 years ago. It's just a very dark coincidence that we're going through something similar in real life right now. Also in the games, the present day is meant to be 2033, not 2023. After Ellie learns about all the extra terrible things that Fedra did, killing all the regular people in addition to the infected, they pan in on the dead bodies of the mother and her baby, flashing back to September 30th, 2003, to show you Bill's origin story in Frank's. 
in this entire part of the episode, all of these flashbacks are not from the game. This is a big change, but I actually think it's a really good change. And it actually bodes well for future seasons. Like a lot of people have problems with The Last of Us 2 video game story. This means when they eventually adapt that stuff in future seasons, they can change it for the better. The whole idea in the video games is they find a version of Bill, but it's like a much darker version of the character long after Frank has died and has driven him to a very dark place. It's a much more depressing take on this whole encounter that they have in the episode and the message that Bill gives them in the TV version of the episode. In the game, Bill was meant to be a darker mirror for what could potentially happen to Joel if he continued to push people away. But they show you how Bill was a survivalist and that's part of the reason why he was able to survive the initial outbreak of the fungus. Because his house was essentially constructed like a fortress, he'd already all kinds of defensive measures set up, all kinds of weapons, like his gear, his whole shelter here, created long before the fungus actually happened. He taunts the military, showing you how deeply he mistrusted them when they're looking for all the people in the town. Turns out pretty smart move on his part because that whole group that they just drove off with in the military trucks were taken to the field to be killed. Notice that he's wearing a gas mask. In the game, the fungus give off spores that can infect you even after you've killed one of them. So the characters frequently have to run around everywhere wearing gas masks, especially when they're going to new areas. In the first time in the game that you see Bill, he's wearing this mask. The reason they cut the spores out of the show is because they didn't want to have everyone's faces covered all the time. Even though Pedro Pascal also plays the Mandalorian and he covers his face all the time. It's one of the major conceits of the character. The spray paint on the front of his door is from the military just to mark that his house had been checked for people and that's why the date on here says 9:30 for September 30th. You can see later after the flash forwards that they eventually painted over that. You notice that his first act was to raid the same gas station that Joel just visited with Ellie where he had stashed all of his stuff, taking as many supplies as he can find, gas, food, anything of use. He was ready to go for this, like he was prepared. The reason he goes to the utility station is to turn the gas back on to his house because one of the military's first acts would have been to shut all that stuff down. He uses a generator for regular power, but he still needs the gas from the normal utility station. The car that he's using to grab all the supplies is also the same car that he winds up giving to Joel and Ellie later in the episode to get the rest of the way to Wyoming. Love the montage of him finishing his preparations too. He creates more traps all around the house, sets up a small farm, gardens for his food. Make sure that the area is self-sufficient. Four years of this go by and then he finds Frank, just a normal human who had stumbled into one of his traps after fleeing the Baltimore quarantine zone after it had fallen to the fungus. When Frank is talking about it, he says it's gone. He means that the fungus, the infected, essentially destroyed the quarantine zone. There is no more quarantine zone in Baltimore. The other nine people that he was traveling with had died along the way at some point on the way to the Boston quarantine zone. And I love their whole first meeting here. Like, it's just hilarious. Just him trying to figure out what's going on with Bill and Bill trying to deal with another human. I wonder if Arby's paid them for this product placement here. Arby's has to be one of the most clowned upon food franchises in TV shows. Bill shows him some compassion and cooks the meal for him. Love that he has no idea what to do with all of Frank's compliments to his kindness. The Tales of Hoffman music is also a reference to Bill and Frank's story together. It was a French opera and in the story, the protagonist is thematically similar to Bill. Then they whip out the Linda Ronstadt song, Long Long Time, which is where the episode gets its title from, and they use the lyrics of the song as a metaphor for Bill and Frank's story, their relationship, as well as Joel and Ellie's story. It's all about surviving, taking things in stride, abiding it all, falling in love with someone, allowing yourself to care about someone else. And that's basically what these two couples are doing slowly over time. Obviously, Bill and Frank a little bit quicker. Also love the joke about him telling Bill to go take a shower like, this is all great, Love what's going on here, but you stink, literally. You have not taken a shower in a long time. Go clean yourself. And they confirm a lot of people's suspicions after the game because the game didn't have any of this stuff. During the game, when you meet Bill, Frank is already dead. He'd killed himself, and Bill talks about him fondly, implying that they had a relationship together. They flash forward three more years to 2010, and they show you how Frank started working with more outsiders like Joel and Tess as Frank started to go crazy from all of Bill's isolationist, paranoid tactics. And as Frank says, making more friends. And it sounds like Frank definitely felt like they were his friends. But at the end of the episode, Bill kind of relents and says, you know what, I wouldn't call you exactly a friend, but you were kind of like a friend. I respect you. And that was meant to be like the highest form of compliment that you get from someone like Bill. You notice when they're having dinner in the yard for the first time, Bill has the gun on them the entire time. Joel verbally references how similar they are in their personalities, the paranoid personalities. Bill's line here about not needing Joel and Tess complicating his life is important for the future of the series. It's what it's all about. The idea that you're supposed to develop those close bonds with other people, allow them to complicate your lives for better and worse. That's the whole point of being alive. 
and Joel reluctantly wins him over with the promise of enough material to replace his fences for the rest of his life, appealing to the survivalist instincts in him. Very smart thinking on Joel's part. As they're leaving, Frank also references the radio codes that Joel told Ellie about in episode one so they could communicate with each other in secret where the songs came from. The trouble that Frank also mentions here is foreshadowing for the trouble that they have with Raiders soon after this, which Joel also talks to Bill about, like there's gonna be Raiders pretty soon, as well as the trouble at the end of the episode where the radio goes off. They flash forward again, three more years to 2013. Love his reaction when he finds out that Frank traded away one of his guns. Wait, which one? As if it's one of his children, like you've given away one of my children. That's how precious his guns are to him. And then a very short while later, raiders do come to steal their stuff, setting off Bill's traps. He's already firing on them, hitting the crossfire. And when Frank is trying to treat his wound, he thinks he's gonna die. So he starts telling Frank all the important things he can think of, like how to survive without him. Call Joel, don't live alone. Here's where the keys are. But later in the episode, they confirmed that all the stuff that you see, the flash forwards were real. They actually did happen. Meaning that Frank really did save Bill's life and they continue to grow old together. They made some big changes from the video game storyline in their backstory, but it's similar to some things that happened in the game. In the backstory of the video game, Frank had got infected and killed himself before the infection could take him. Bill wound up surviving and just drove into a very dark place. On the show, Frank basically does the same thing, only instead of the fungus that took him, it was a neurological condition that was killing him. And he chose to end his life before it got worse, and Bill also chose to end his life with him. Even though it's still super dark, it's a much more positive spin on the characters than in the game. Like the whole episode just felt way more positive, even though there's a lot of really dark stuff that happens. That's why I say there's a lot of hope when we get to season two, season three, like future seasons of them making an even better version of The Last of Us 2 storyline. Bill talking to Frank about how he lived a happy life, he's been fulfilled through his relationship with Frank is meant to be foreshadowing for Joel and Ellie's future father-daughter relationship. Like Joel will go through a similar character arc in the future. When they're panning around the house, they show you Frank's artwork that he did over the years. This one's of Bill in the chair. This one's of Bill's face. I think this other one is supposed to be of Joel though because it's of a younger person. This is also meant to be the last one of Bill that you see in present day, kind of confirming the timeline. Frank's condition has made it hard for him to get around, hard for him to do basic tasks, which is why he comes to the decision to end his life. And he creates this elaborate swan song ending for himself to have one last good day with Bill, then euthanize himself before the disease can get even worse. And as they carry their plan out, they pan around all the locations that were important to their history, like the trap where he met Bill for the first time, the garden that Frank surprised him with 10 years ago. They get married, they have the special dinner, and if you couldn't tell, the food that Bill cooked him is meant to be the exact same meal that he cooked for him the first day that they met. That's why Frank was so surprised and happy about it. Like, oh, it's the same meal that you made me that first time. The first wine that they drink is also meant to be the same wine that they drank on that day. The second bottle of wine is the one that was spiked with the medicine. And if it wasn't clear from the reaction on Frank's face, they kind of talk about it a little bit more after the fact. But when Bill downed his wine in one gulp, he had spiked the entire wine bottle before he poured both glasses. That's why when Frank asked if his was enough to take care of the job, Bill said that that would be enough to kill a horse because he'd already given him a dose of it in the bottle. But the whole idea here is that Frank says that he lived a life of purpose. He's completely fulfilled. Frank was his purpose, so he doesn't want to continue living without him. When Joel and Ellie arrive, you see the final painting of Bill that Frank had been doing just before they died. The wine bottles on the table, the food that's only slightly decomposed just lets you know how recently they died. It seems like it's only been a couple days because it's only been a couple days since episode one. Confirming that they died right before the events of episode one, just because of when the countdown in the bunker went off. Ellie finds the letter that Bill left for Joel and Tess because remember, Bill didn't know that Tess died on the way out and also Joel didn't know that Bill and Frank had died either. And here's one of the other big changes from the video game. So the message that Ellie reads is almost the exact opposite of what Bill tells Joel at the end of their scenes in the game. The letter talks about how he was wrong to push everyone away his whole life. There's always that one person out there worth saving and for him it was Frank and it's meant to inspire Joel that Ellie is going to become that person. But obviously as happy as the episode was, this ending was for them. They found everything that they needed. They also want to remind you how grim and traumatic things are by referencing Tess in the letter. Just reminding Joel why it is that he pushes so many people away. One of the other differences here too is that when they arrive at Bill's in the game, a lot of that part of the game is them going on missions to try and assemble the parts that they need to actually get the car to start. Whereas during the episode, Bill basically just gives them the car and the battery is almost ready to go. They also cut the bloater encounter, which Ellie referenced in episode two, the infected with extra tough hides that throw spore bombs. Maybe we'll see more bloaters in future episodes. 
The reason Joel smiles when he opens the fridge is because he finds the car battery pretty much ready to go. Like they have to charge it a little bit, which they also kind of have to do in the game too. They have to charge the battery by getting the car to run. And he's also smiling looking at the battery because it's a reference back to episode one. It's the reason why he wound up mixed up with Ellie in the first place over the stolen car battery. They make their plan to go out to Wyoming to Tommy's settlement to check on him and then see if he can help them get Ellie to the other Fireflies, which is also right out of the game. They head there during the game and we've seen footage of them in the trailers too. Ellie's whole conversation to Joel about Tess trying to talk about her goes exactly how it did in the game. Like this is all a dialogue taken right out of the game. Listen, about Tess. Rule one, you don't bring up Tess, ever. About Tess, I, I don't even know what Here's how this thing's gonna play out. You don't bring up Tess, ever. The whole idea is that Joel just hits the pause button on working through his feelings like, we will not be dealing with anything. There's no therapy going on in this episode. Push that sadness deep down inside you. When they go down to the bunker, the song that's playing is Erasure's Chains of Love, which is a reference to the song that was playing over the radio in episode one, the sign that there was trouble coming. And Joel confirms the timeline, explaining that the countdown was set to play this in case he didn't reset it every day. Me, that Bill and Frank died just before the events of episode one. The box of women's shirts that they find is where Ellie gets her t-shirt, which is also right out of the games. I think in this context, they're meant to have gotten this box of women's shirts, even though there are no women that lived here, from scavenging around the town. Ellie finds Bill's handgun, finally getting a gun that she'd been asking for this whole time. I think this is meant to be the one that he always carried on his hip. Pretty safe to assume that gun is going to come in handy eventually. When they take off, Joel getting the seatbelt for her is him also being kind of like a dad. A lot of dad energy from Joel at the end of the episode. Going on a road trip, gotta play a mixtape. She finds the mixtape that Frank made for Bill and the song playing on it is the Linda Ronstadt song. Like that was meant to be Bill and Frank's song. That's why he put it on the mixtape. Like this is our special song. The window that the camera ends on is the bedroom window where they died because he said in the letter that he left the window open to keep the house from stinking up. And like I said, as they play the song over the end of the episode, as they drive away, the lyrics of the song are also meant to be a metaphor for the future of Joel and Ellie's relationship, finding someone else to care about. Probably going to go down as one of the best episodes of the series, like I said, so it'll be interesting to see if they can top this later this season. If you spotted any other Easter eggs or references in the episode that I didn't mention in the video, write them below in the comments. My episode 4 trailer video will post next, and my full episode 4 video will post next Sunday after they release it. Congratulations, Midori Bushi. You're the giveaway winner from my last Last of Us video. Please email me on the about page of my channel so I can get your contact details. Everyone click here for the Last of Us episode four trailer video. I'll update the link as soon as I post the video and click here for all my Last of Us episodes. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.